And again, you lose about 25, I always think 25, 25, that's 29%. So if you actually absorb light at two electron volts or in the green and the blue in silicon, you lose the carriers before they can thermalize down to the band edge and they have to thermalize down to the band edge and to be able to be extracted from the circuit. So you can see it's about 25%. Um, and those are in hero devices. Now you can buy silicon about 18 to 20% or so. And sometimes those 18 to 20% um, devices, though, have other tricks in terms of what they've done for roughness to get light into the devices and what they've done in the contacts and that actually push up the, um, and push up the cost. Um, and I, again, I apologize, I cut on the wrong slides here, so some of these are dated. Uh, but you, if you actually go and look at this, this is on um, from the NREL website, you'll find that silicon really hasn't changed too much. And what's happening is you're actually seeing devices that are getting more efficient because they have multiple junctions in it. Um, so these originally were called tandem solar cells where they had two junctions. Um, now they can have three, four, five junctions in them, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a few moments. And that's to harvest more energy from the um, from the from the solar spectrum. And these other devices are um, become really quite expensive, and most of these multi-junction devices tend to be used in um, in space applications of that. So part of the thrust of this work is. Uh, how do you move beyond silicon, this, um, this, um, this single semiconductor junction? And as I indicated before, the issue with silicon is that it's actually, a, it's actually um, an indirect band gap material. So to get significant absorption in it, you need one or 200 microns of material. And when you go to wide band gap, or sorry, when you go to, um, Direct band gap materials, you only need about one thousandth of that um, thickness of material due to the fact that it more efficiently absorbs light with that. So what's, what's the approach to be able to make a more efficient solar cell? And the idea here is, is to add in more junctions. So you can, if you look at silicon, um, which I'll show later on, silicon, this band gap sits around about here. Um, and sits around about here. So if I want to harvest more light, I can harvest more light by putting in, um, and this is this, this is the solar spectrum on the um, surface of the earth. Um, a lot of these dips in that, in the spectrum are actually just due to um, absorption in the atmosphere. Um, normally, normally water absorption, that's where we get clouds from. So if I add in something that can absorb in the blue, absorb in the green, absorbing the yellow, absorbing the red, that's typically where silicon is, right? We can actually then, um, we can then actually absorb more of this um, power spectrum, i.e. of the light that's on the surface of the, the surface of the air. <clears throat> our quasar, our shock quasar limit, which is a theoretical limit, if you do this properly, can take you up to about 86. 86.8%. I don't need to read what's on the um, on the slides. I'm sure you can do that. Um, you never see more than about 80% of that theoretical limit in any device. So this is telling us we should be able to get up to devices of about 60-70% efficiency by using um, multiple by using multiple junctions in the device. So you could go back and recalculate this. And if we want to get a device that's above about 50% efficiency, then typically we're going to have to have about five band gaps in the, in, in the material of that. Um, the core issue then becomes um, to be able to make these materials, you need semiconductors with band gaps of more than about 2.5 EV. And that's limited in some of the tribes. And that's why we went and started looking at the nitrides in this area. So if you go and check on Google Scholar, you'll see that uh, my top rank, two of my 
top three ranked papers around making these highly efficient solar cell devices. I think my second ranked paper now is on um, some of the physiological aspects of lighting. So at this time, this was a three junction cell. They've now gone up to four junctions. In some of our work, we got up to about 42%. And you can see this says at 240 suns. So that means that this was a concentrated light that was on top of the cell. The other thing is this is not actually showing all the um, layers in here. But once you go up to, uh, once you go up to um, something where you want these higher efficiencies, and if you have four junctions in here, you may have um, 100 different layers, and it may take you, um, it may take you 10 or 12 hours to grow this um, crystalline structure in the material. So if you look um, at this previous device in here, you have gallium-indium phosphide for this wide band gap material. So obviously, as you go from the top where you're absorbing light, you go from wider to medium to smaller band gap. So you take out the light as you're going through. Um, if you look here, this device was made of germanium, gallium arsenide, and um, gallium indium phosphide. And if you remember, previously I mentioned about these nitride materials, and they'll cover the whole of the visible spectrum, and across the higher blue and into the infrared, that makes them potentially good for solar uh, and for solar devices. So I can replace these three different material systems. Um, and multiple band gaps of materials all within one, all within one material system. But then this is a new material system which originally had been developed for, uh, which originally had actually been developed for lighting. And now we're trying to use this in solar, in solar applications. So the approach that we took was, um, was to actually <clears throat> make these devices from different materials but to split the solar spectrum. So a simple way of doing this um, is you can create optics where you split everything up and then you combine the power in an external circuit. So this is one where essentially you have a solar cell, which would be a nitride solar cell that looks like a mirror, looks like a window, and most of the light will pass through it. And a dichromatic filter where you can actually put in different um, where you can put in different types of cells. So part of what we did in our contribution was to make these gallium indium nitride and solar cells to fit into this um, uh, and to make these higher band gap materials. What's interesting is, um, unfortunately this got covered, most of these cells, because they are actually concentrated um, <clears throat> and we were, <clears throat> we're using them under optics, you no longer have a need for a, for a device that's six by six inches. Um, what you're using are devices that are five by five millimeters, three by three millimeters, and I may even have some smaller devices on here, and different, and different contacting schemes. The problem is when you're making a new material, you don't know that anything about it. You're trying to work out how do you grow it, um, what's its property is going to look like, how are you characterizing, um, how are you fabricating the devices, how do you model it, and I'll, I'll roll a dex through some of this. So we used a thing called PC1D, um, it's a commercially available software, well it's not commercially available, I think it's open source so anybody can pick it up. Part of what we had to do was to sort out all these material files as well. Um, in these wide band gaps, it tends to be very difficult to p-type drop the material to make a good, um, and to be able to make a good um, um, PN junction. And you know, our modeling, when we went and started originally, we were looking at larger junctions. And from our modeling, we were able to work out that our depletion zone, um, i.e. where we had this field, was only about 200 microns into the, into the material. So we were able to do things such as um, and thinning down the device and moving this contact up just by simple uh, modeling. Again, I'm not going through this in detail. The other issue you have with the nitride materials is um, it tends to want to segregate during growth. So when you grow gallium nitride with indium nitride in it, um, um, these two materials want